All right, if you would, turn with me to me to Matthew 22. Okay, so um, we did the parable of the wedding banquet. We're going to skip um, paying the imperial tax to Caesar because uh, we covered that, uh, if you remember, in Matthew part 44, uh, chapter 17, um, uh, when, when we did chapter 17, verse 22 through 27. So if you want to see what I have to say on that, it's in, um, in Matthew uh, part 44 online. Um, so we're going to skip that and go to marriage at the resurrection, um, which is Matthew 22, verse 23 through 33. Feel free to go there. Feel free. Okay. Um, that same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection. Okay, so since we skipped paying the imperial tax to Caesar, we know they, that Jesus has been talking to this, uh, the ch- chief priests, um, and the priests at the temple, right? And so what it tells us in that one little section is that this is a different day, a different time. It's not a continuation of that conversation. We're in a new conversation. Um, and so paying the imperial tax to Caesar and this um, go together, but it's not like um, we need to know what that says to go through this. They're kind of just everyone's taking their shot at Jesus and asking different questions that are random. Uh, So that same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and third brother, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Jesus replied, You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. All right, so um, we've been reading and discussing uh, the interaction that Jesus had with the chief priests and the elders. Um, and so now they have some more questions, and they're really just tests. You can kind of tell as you're reading it, like, is someone really asking this question? It sounds like when a kid comes and asks you a question, uh, and you're just like, oh, well, I mean, that's never going to happen. So um, you don't have to worry about it, but uh, they still want to answer. So that last conversation with the, uh, about taxes was with the Pharisees. Um, and this one is concerning the Sadducees, and it's important to know where it's coming from because the Pharisees and the Sadducees have different theologies concerning uh, the resurrection um, and concerning the afterlife. Uh, and we have to remember those are different things, okay? Afterlife and resurrection are different things. They're talking about different things. But we need to talk about these different thoughts that the Pharisees and the Sadducees have because it's going to matter in the answer that Jesus gives. Um, so, and I know we've talked about the differences between Pharisees and Sadducees um, many times, but as I've learned, as I've been a pastor, I know that um, no one remembers what I say. So I'm going to re- do a refresher. Um, like, what was that about? Ah. Okay. So um, the Sadducees... Uh, were the wealthy governing class of religious leaders. They're the chief priests. They would be the people in the temple, the the highest priests in the temple. They're mainly at the temple in Jerusalem. The Pharisees are more like in the local synagogues. Um, So the people Jesus was talking to last week in the temple were the Sadducees. Um, And Pharisees were talking to him about taxes. And now the Sadducees are testing him. And next week, it's going to be the Pharisees again. And then the Sadducees, because they're just like uh, taking turns. Um, And the Sadducees were seen as collaborators with Romans, um, and basically they were. Um, They were willing to cooperate with any authority over the Jews. They would cooperate as long as they could keep their power, as long as they could keep their position. Um, And in fact, many of them paid for their positions to begin with. Um, The Sadducees did not accept the oral or scribal law, which is a good thing. The oral or scribal law is like, they would kind of read the Bible and then say, oh, and this, and this, and I've gone over that, and it becomes a lengthy, lengthy list of rules and how to wash hands and blah, 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 blah. The Sadducees didn't accept that. They just accept, accepted the scriptures, which are like, oh, that's a good thing. But they only accepted the Pentateuch. 
Uh, so that's the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those are the only books they accepted. Um, so they didn't accept any of the writings of the prophets. So, how, I mean, how can you even see that Jesus is coming and who he is when you don't believe the writings of the prophets? Uh, they didn't believe in, um, they didn't believe in like Job or Esther or any, anything except for the first five books in the Bible. Okay, so while the Pharisees did believe in life after death, they believed in the afterlife, and they believed in resurrection, different things, okay? And they believed that if you did not believe it, you were cut off from God if you didn't believe in the afterlife and the resurrection. Um, so the Sadducees, they did not believe in life after death or resurrection in any way. And these are the people asking the question, okay? They're asking this question about seven, seven brides for seven brothers. Sorry, I got confused because of movies. I uh, asked about this bride and seven brothers, and they don't even believe in what they're asking about, okay? And they didn't believe in afterlife or resurrection because it couldn't be proven within the first five books. Everything had to be proven within the first five books, okay? Um, but the Pharisees have, as they like to do, they like to um, read the Bible and then add a bunch of things. Uh, so they had some really incredible doctrine uh, on the afterlife and resurrection based on Scripture, and based on fancy, um, and I'll just give you some examples. So they determined that when you died, you would remain and you would come back in the clothes you died in. Uh, because um, when Samuel is called uh, forth by the witch of Endor to talk to Saul, um, he's wearing his priestly garments and he looks like himself. And he's recognizable. So because of that, they, they would say, okay, so he, he's going to come back dressed in the same clothes and, and looking the exact same. But they also believed, and this one I believe to be true for sure, um, they believed that all Jews would be resurrected in the Holy Land so that if a Jew, if they were bur buried in a foreign land, there were these underground caverns and their bodies would roll under the earth to pop up in the Holy Land. Plausible, right? Um, so... Um, and you just have, you, just, you can tell just by that how much they thought about stuff and got together. And maybe a little, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's it's just, a, just a crazy theory, all right? But I don't know, man, if you get enough of that frankincense going on, you get a little crazy. Um, so uh, the Sadducees are asking this question to trick Jesus. Um, and at the same time, they're trying to make a fool of that idea. They're trying to make a fool of the afterlife, trying to make a fool of the idea of the resurrection, trying to make a fool of the Pharisees, right? Win-win. Strict -win. Jesus, make the Pharisees look bad. It's all about making themselves look good. Um, so this is, this is hypothetical a situation. Um, in fact, uh, the situation could possibly be based on a story in a book they had uh, called the Book of Tobit or Tobit or Hobbit. No, it's, um, it's one of those, but not the Hobbit one, Tobit or Tobit. And, so, and it can be found in some Catholic Bibles. Um, but this book is almost like an Aesop's Fables. Um, and you see why they didn't include it in the Bible, because some people get upset about why things weren't included in the Bible. But you can't have a, a book of, of things that actually happened and then put fables in there, because some people think the things that actually happened are fables. So you, you don't want to add that and confuse people um, about what it's about. So in this fable book. Um, there's always fake characters and absurd situations, but every story has a moral, right? Um, so in that book, there's a story about a woman who marries seven brothers, but a demon kills them before they can consummate the marriage, leaving her childless. So this just adds to how stupid this question is because they're taking it from a fable and, and making it look like these are, this, is, this is a fable, this idea of afterlife and resurrection. And you know, as Christians, um, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but you should get used to it at some point. People sometimes ask similar questions to try to shake your faith. Ask questions that are ridiculous, that are stupid, that have no answers. And the idea is really to question your, make you question your faith. Like, the, like um, can God rate, make a rock that is too heavy for him to carry? And if you don't have the answer, it's like, well, God's not real then. Because we don't know if he can make a rock. That's too heavy for him to carry. I'm like, that's a dumb question. That's, that's, that's foolishness, right? And so don't allow that kind of thing to shake your faith because you don't have answers for those things because um, it's dumb. 
Um, so in this question, we have a woman who is married, but her husband dies without producing children. And so she's given to his brother, and that continually happens until she's been married to all seven brothers, consummating the marriage each time um, until she finally dies. And the question is, whose wife is she? Is she? Um, and since the Sadducees only believed in the first five books, this question obviously concerns um, something written in one of those. Okay, so this question refers to the Mosaic Levite law in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. And it says, if brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. However, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at the town and say, my husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to me. Then the elders of his town shall summon him and talk to him. If he persists in saying, I do not want to marry her, his brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, take off one of his sandals, spit in his face, and say, this is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line. And that man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. The family of the unsandaled. Uh, but this actually, and I'm talking about this today because this is biblical and we need to bring it back within the, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding. But this actually, um, and they say, all right, this is the Mosaic Law. But it actually predates the Mosaic Law uh, because in Genesis 38, if you remember when we were going through Genesis, um, it said, then Judah said to Onan, sleep with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as a, he was dead, <laughs> as a brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother. So we see even before the Mosaic Law, that was, that was there, okay? And the Sadducees are trying to point out to everyone they're not just asking Jesus a the question. They're trying to point out to everyone that you can't keep the Mosaic law and believe in the resurrection. These things don't go together, right? Uh, they can't co coexist, and we just proved it. We just showed you why, okay? But adding to the ridiculous of, ridiculousness of this question is the fact that in Jesus' time, they really still didn't observe this at all. The time had passed, and they, they didn't observe this in, in this time. And so they ask Jesus, and Jesus, who is awesome, um, goes for the throat and responds. And this is how you can respond if someone asks you a dumb question. You say, you're an error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God, right? And then take off their shoe and spit in their face <laughs> and say, your family is the unsandaled ones. Um, if you can get all that done, um, I expect there'll be some uh, resistance. But... He says to them, you are an error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. He totally rips apart their argument, their stupid little question, by telling them you don't know the scriptures. You do not know the power of God. Neither of those things. And he tells them something that they have no way of knowing. He tells them something supernatural that only he would know, that only God would know, something that hasn't been revealed. It was something beyond their understanding of the scripture. And honestly, this is beyond our understanding also. Um, and honestly, when I read the scripture, and maybe when you hear the scripture, or when you read the scripture, it might make you sad. You start to wonder, what does that mean? What does that mean? Does it mean that special relationship I have with Daisy, um, I won't have that? Um, what does it mean about my children? Um, and, and some people have thought, like, will they not recognize me? Will, will everything be the same? And it makes us sad. It makes you sad to think that could be the case, right? Um, and we, it makes us think, I don't know if I want that. I don't know if I want that. I don't know if heaven sounds so good after all. Um, will there be things that I don't like in heaven? Um, because we always assume that heaven's going to be everything that we like. You know, whenever, uh, whenever, everyone's always doing the thing they like, which for men, I guess, is golf, right? Like, so like, if I go to heaven based on everyone's theology, I'd be like, I, I don't want to be part of a foursome. Does anyone want to do something else? Does anyone want to, I don't really want to, I'll drive, sure, I'll drive. Um, but we're going to talk about this and think about it, okay? Now, some scholars have noted that it says 
there will be no marrying, nor will anyone be given in marriage. So they believe if you're already married, then your marriage continues. But if you're single, for eternity, <laughs> right? Um, and I admit, and, you know, these are just things people think. It's not what I think. Um, and I admit, I don't know how it's going to work. Um, some might say, oh, marriage, we don't need marriage because it was a product of the fall of man. Or it was something just to uh, cause people to reproduce and, and build um, families and, uh, as, as their life uh, times grew shorter. But the institution was around before the fall of man. Before. In the garden. When things were still, still perfect. Adam and Eve. Um, but I do know this. This is what I know. Here on earth, we have different types of love. Um, we have eros, which is passion. Um, and I might say these wrong because I don't really care. Um, philia, which is deep friendship. Uh, ludus, which is playful love. I don't really know what that consists of. Agape, which is love for everyone. As Christians, we learn a lot about that agape one. Uh, pragma, which is longstanding love. Um, philatia, which is love of the self. Uh, storge, which is family love. And then mania, which is obsessive love. Um, and some of these, some of these loves are of God, and some not so much. And some we've added our own little things to that type of love, but it's not perfect. Um, like our love for everyone isn't perfect as it should be. Our family love isn't perfect as it should be. Our love of the self isn't perfect as it should be. It's a little, it goes a little overboard. Sometimes we don't have it at all. Deep friendship, it's not as it should be, Okay. Um, some of these have elements of sin that have taken away the purity of each of these loves, okay? Um, so in the presence of God, we are complete. When in the presence of God, love is complete. Joy is complete. Peace is complete, which is beyond our understanding. Can you understand complete peace? complete joy, and complete love. It's something we don't even know that we don't understand it. I mean, some of you guys, especially if you start dating, like, you know, you'll go home after this and talk and be all like, um, yay, like, I, I have complete love for you. Don't worry about what that person said. My love for you is complete. Like, Do you love me completely? I don't, where do we stand? I... <laughs> the guy's going to bring that up. You know it. Um, so... <laughs> you're going to love me more than the baby? If we have a baby, you're going to love me more than that baby? Um, <laughs> see, that's not pure love. It's weird. Okay? Um, that was from a movie. That didn't happen in our lives. Uh, <laughs> Someone would be like, did he do that to Daisy? Daisy, did he do that? Um, but in the presence of God, we're complete. Uh, our joy will be complete. And so... Our love being complete, all of these loves, okay, deep friendship, love, love for everyone, love for self. It isn't just one type of love. It's not just romantic love that's complete. All of our love is complete, which is so deep, it's difficult to understand that we would have a perfect love for all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, a perfect love. It'll be a love of deep friendship, a love for everyone, a longstanding love, a family love, uh, for all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I believe we will, you're, we will remember people. We will remember our spouse, our children, our relationships. We won't be nameless and faceless. And I say this because God formed us to have relationship with us. He formed us to have relationship. So he knows the value of relationship. He, 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 for, he created it. So he, it is a thing of God. Relationships are a thing of God in their essence, okay? Not all your relationships. But he knows the value of relationships because he gave us these relationships. And so when God creates something, it's eternal. Uh, he, I don't believe he means to cut that off. I, I just think that all of our relationships are going to be raised. All of our relationships will be uh, in a perfect love, and this might make you wonder, but It'd be like, I might not love one person more than the other, but it'll be different. And the best way I can explain that 
is your children, if you have children. Um, and if you don't, you'll be childless for all eternity. No, I'm just kidding. Um, that's not true. Um, your children, they're all different. But you love them each with the same amount of love. But your love for each is different. And maybe after you have a first kid, you might think, because people were telling me when I was going to have a second kid, they were like, hey, um, don't worry. You're going to love your second kid as much as your first. And I was like, I wasn't thinking about that. Now should I think about that? That's like, I, that never came in my mind. Um, but now I need to think about it. Um, but it's true. I love my second and my third child as much as my first, just differently. It's, a, it's just different, but it's the same. It's the same value. And I think this is what heaven is going to be like. We will love everyone as much as we possibly can. It's just going to be different for each one, if that makes sense to you. I don't believe any relationship will be stolen. Um, and then Jesus says, we'll be like the angels in heaven. And this is another blow to the Sadducees because they do not believe in angels either. Um, and this does not say, because uh, sometimes uh, this is theology, this happens a lot in movies. It doesn't say we will become angels. It doesn't say that. Because sometimes like, oh, we become angels. We, we don't. It says, in this situation, in this matter, we will, concerning marriage, all, our situation will be like the angels. And then he goes on to say, but about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And even now we have some different theologies concerning afterlife and resurrection. And I know this is hard to talk about for some people. I know, but it's here. And Jesus talked about it. And it should, I want to clear things up because it should bring comfort. Um, that Jesus is like, this is real. This is a real thing. Afterlife and resurrection are real. Um, but there's different theologies on the resurrection. Some believe, like, right after you die, you go to heaven. And some is like, um, you, you lay in wait until the resurrection. But we have to remember, afterlife and resurrection are different. They can both happen. Okay? Um, I know I went to a funeral of a friend of mine um, who's a young man. And he, um, and I was at a Seventh Day Adventist church. I'm not trying to law bombs the Seventh Day Adventist, but um, and the pastor is trying to comfort everyone, and he's like, um, I don't want to say his name, and he's like, one day, guys, Sean's head's just gonna come popping up out of that grave, and then someone else's head is gonna pop up out of the grave, and just graves' heads are gonna start popping up, and I'm just like, I, everyone's picturing a zombie apocalypse. No one is picturing this as a good thing. No one's like, well, praise God. I can't wait till he digs himself up out of that ground. You know, that's not comforting. It's creepy and weird, which I said at my job, which was full of Seventh-day Adventists. Um, and so we ended up in an argument. And so we ended up agreeing. Um, I was like, look, even if, even if that happens, it's not going to be, it'll be a moment to them. Um, but Jesus says himself here. Okay, so listen on, Seventh-day Adventists. Jesus says here that God is the God of the living. He introduces himself to Moses by saying, I am the God of your forefathers. He doesn't say, I was the God and I will be again. I was their God, I will be again. He says, I am the God of them. I am the God of them. I still have relationship with them. I am still their God. When Jesus um, is on the mountain of transfiguration, he's conversing with Moses and Elijah. They were there. He was talking to them, okay? They, so, um, and it tells us Moses died. You could say Elijah, well, he was taken up in, in a fiery chariot, so he never died. Moses died, okay? So, so that, that argument doesn't stand here. And he's conversing with them, and they look like they did. The disciples know who they are by looking at them. When he's on the cross, he tells the thief next to him, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, sure, assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Today. It's in the scriptures to be found if we look. But, these, but Jesus doesn't just say, you do not know the scriptures. But he also says, you do not know the power of God. 
And we talk a lot about knowing the scriptures, how important it is so that we're not, we're not misled. And I do think if, if we were going to make an accusation and throw it out, if Jesus was going to say something to the church right now, he might say, you are in error, church, because you do not know the scriptures and you do not know the power of God. You don't know either one. Both are important to know. I've been to a lot of churches uh, where even they've started to revamp, say we need to get into the scripture. And they're in the scriptures, but there's no power of God. And we need to know both of them. Jesus says it himself. And this is why he tells them, this is why you, you not just need to know the scriptures, but the power of God. These men do not believe in resurrection. Their theology is that the resurrection doesn't happen, something they've made up. They've looked in the scriptures, but they obviously don't know the power of God because they've decided in their hearts the resurrection is not possible, but they've been looking and waiting for a Messiah, which they don't know what to look for because they don't believe the prophets. They don't know the scriptures. In just a few days' time, Jesus will die and what? Be resurrected. Jesus is going to be resurrected as the sign that he is the son of God, that he is the Messiah. That's what's going to happen. He will be resurrected and they will miss it. They won't see what God is doing presently in their midst. They won't see Jesus as the Messiah. Their lives cannot be changed. They cannot witness the power of God in their time before their eyes because they do not know the scriptures and they do not know the power of God. They miss it. And Jesus is warning them, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss what I'm doing because you don't even believe it's possible. Because you don't even believe it's possible. They blind themselves to the truth of who Jesus is because they can't believe in the act that he's about to do. And even in this, Jesus is trying to show them the way. But they're blind because of their own thought, their own theology. They're blind to the power of God. And for us, what we need to make sure of as, as a people, is God working out a way for us? Is God working out a miracle? Is God working out a healing? Is God working out a change in our life that we cannot or will not see because we do not believe in the power of God? We believe in the scriptures, but we do not believe in the power of God. We don't expect healing when we pray. We don't expect miracles. We don't expect God to do anything about anything. We pray, but we pray like, Lord, I just I talk about it all the time. Do we, as a people, as a people of God, do you individually, do you know the scriptures? Do you believe in the power of God? Because you might miss what Jesus is doing. And if you look at the church today, I'm telling you, if you look at the church today, these two accusations, they fly. They fly. You don't know the scriptures. You don't know the power of God. Do, do we not pray in tongues or prophesy? Because we don't believe in it. We don't believe in it. Guess what? Power of God is outside of our understanding. It's supernatural. There are denominations who believe that that was just for that time and that place. That whole theology is built on doubt. That that can't happen anymore. That won't happen anymore. And so they don't even expect it. They don't look for it. They don't pray for it. And guess what? They're going to miss it. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss what God is doing. When I'm praying, I don't want to miss when God moves. I want to expect. I want to hope because I believe in the power of God and I know the scriptures and I've seen what he's done. I know what he can do. I know that he's faithful. I know he doesn't change. And so I believe in the power of God to change my circumstance. Am I right? We need to know the power of God. We need to know it. We need to step out of our comfort zones. It's going it, to, guys, guys, straight up. We're going to have to step out of our comfort zones. We are. You know, when we pray, we pray. And if, if you're new and you haven't seen us, where we just do a day where we just all get in groups and pray. Oh, my God. I'll tell you straight up. I understand. I would, as a visitor, I would say, I got to go to the bathroom. Honey, in 10 minutes, go to the bathroom. Kids, in five minutes, go to the bathroom. And then we are going. We're checking out because that's scary. 
But what does the devil not want us to do as a people of God? Get together and pray. Get together and pray. So that we can see the power. We're never gonna, how, are we gonna, how are we going to know when God answers prayers if we don't know the prayers of the people of God? Jesus said himself, my house will be a house of prayer. How much prayer is going on in church? And when we're worshiping, people are like, there's a lot of songs to stand up to. And I say, well, heaven's going to suck for you. <laughs> you can sit down. You can sit down. But Paul warns us in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, he says, but mark this. Mark it. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. This hasn't happened yet, but just in the future, be on the lookout. (laughs) And people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. And again, this isn't happening now. Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash. Man, he's just on a, I'm just like writing, he's writing this thing out. Conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Mark this, having a form of godliness. Even with all of that stuff, they have a form of godliness, but denying its power. Denying the power of God. And we, we as Christians go to church on Sunday, and we live for ourselves the rest of the week. We have a form of godliness, but we deny its power. I want to see the power of God. I don't want to deny the power of God. We have to know the scriptures and the power of God. When Paul spoke to the Corinthians, he said this in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. It says, and so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. Paul, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. I didn't talk with eloquence. I didn't come with wisdom. My message and my preaching were not wise They were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. I can explain to you why God is real. I can argue why God is real. I can use the scriptures. We can talk about science. We can talk about stuff. And I can talk talk to you about how God is real. You know how I know God is real? Because I've seen him work in my life. Because I've seen him work out miracles. Because I've seen him change things. I've seen him answer prayer. And even Paul, who like is just ripping everybody all the time, can you just picture him coming in like weakness and trembling and not eloquence of words? And we say things like, well, I'm not, I'm not good with words. I'm, I'm shy. I don't know how to talk to people. We don't go with our own power. We don't go with our own wisdom. We go in the power of God. We got to trust that God's going to move. It's not about what we say. If God tells us to go talk to someone or pray for someone, it is not about what we say. It's not where we lay our hands. Okay, it's about the power of God. It's all him. Everything, it's all him. God tells us to do something. We do it faithfully and expect him to move. We're not expecting to do it right. You don't have to do it perfect. You just go. You just go and do it and trust God's gonna do the work. And God will do the work because he's faithful. Who here wants to see the power of God as a church? We gotta see the power of God. And to do that, we have to believe in the power of God. And to do that, we have to pray. We have to pray together. We have to pray by ourselves. We have to seek his face. We have to ask things that are impossible. And I know that there are times God has not answered those prayers. But don't let that become your theology. God has a plan. But God wants us to ask for things that are important. He knows our heart. And I'm not, saying, I'm not saying like iPads or something. I'm not saying like it's prosperity gospel. I'm saying pray for things that are not possible, that only God can answer. I've seen him do it. I've seen him heal, heal my body. He's healed my body. And I didn't even think it was me. So someone out there has got this, you're healed. And someone's like, oh, that was you. And I was like, well, I wish he'd done something else. Um, that wasn't really me. I don't really. And then, and then for the rest of my life, never had that issue again. 
No one can tell me God's not real. No one can tell me that God has no power. No one can tell me God doesn't care about me and God won't move mountains for me. And God won't handle things that I think I can handle them myself. It's okay, God, I still love you. I can handle this by myself. He says, no, I can handle it for you. I can walk you through it. God wants to show you his power. And as a church, I hope you want to see it. I hope you believe in it. Because he, I don't want to miss, I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss what he's doing and what he can do because I don't believe in it. Amen? Lord, we want to see you move. That's a great song title. We should do that. Lord, we want to see you move. We want to see you at work. We want to see prayers answered, Lord. We, we have, we have a, whether we're in a church that has that theology or not, we as individuals have a theology in our hearts, some of us, of doubt that you cannot or will not. And it causes us to believe maybe he doesn't exist. Maybe he doesn't love me. Maybe I'm not good enough. And it all begins, it all begins with not believing in your power. And so I just pray for a demonstration of your power in our lives. I pray for a demonstration of your power in our prayer lives. I pray for a demonstration of your power while we worship. I pray for a demonstration of your power in our homes. I pray for a demonstration of your power in our children. I pray for a demonstration of your power in every aspect of our lives as we surrender them to you. For you are the king of all. Teach us your word and teach us who you are that we might know the scriptures, that we might know your power, not just believe in it, but know it. First-hand experience and to know your love in our hearts, first-hand experience. And I pray it for everyone in this room that they would go forth in power. Wherever, they, wherever you've called them to go, they would go forth in power and not trust on their own understanding, but trusting in nothing but the power of God to move. In this church, we trust not in my speaking, not in the building that we have, not in the music that we have. We're just trusting in your power. We trust in your power. This was made by you. It will be sustained by you. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>